In the birthmark, Nathaniel Hawthorne explores several juxtapositions, one of which is the juxtaposition between science and romantic love. So in the first paragraph, he says, uh, it was not unusual for the love of science to rival the love of woman in its depth and absorbing energy. Uh, and that's, that's a juxtaposition that um, really that uh, Mary Shelley explores in Frankenstein as well. Victor Frankenstein uh, is kind of torn between his, really his obsession with um, science or his obsession in, you know, creating life artificially and his, and his love interest uh, as well. In fact, this, this story, uh, as we'll see in many ways, it, it, it parallels Frankenstein. Uh, another juxtaposition Hawthorne explores is the juxtaposition between matter and spirit. You know, the, the old uh, Cartesian split, uh, if you will. Um, that, um, you know, the, the main character, uh, Elmer, um, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it, but um, Elmer, we'll say, his name actually sounds like the a little bit like the word alchemy, which itself is kind of a combination of um, science and and superstition, science and and um, kind of you know occult practices, and and the the alchemist in the Middle Ages uh, also were very interested in the um, you know the the juxtaposition of of matter. And spirit, uh, they did these uh, experiments to try to transform uh, material. Uh, like w one of the maybe the goal, uh, the uh, one of the main goals of alchemists was uh, to be able to um, to transform just you know regular matter into gold. Um, so it's kind of a science, but a you know, but a kind of dabbling with science and spirituality, which is, again, an another juxtaposition and the birthmark. So science and romantic love, matter and spirit, um, reality and fantasy, another juxtaposition. Uh, as far as matter and spirit, um, so Alamer, in addition to his name, um, calling to mind uh, alchemy, he's also the... He's described, uh, um, Hawthorne describes him as the pale philosopher. So he he's like the stereotype of, you know, someone who's pale because he's, you know, he lives in his head. He stays in his room all day doing experiments, you know, never gets out in the, in the sunlight. And he's very cerebral. You know, he's always, you know, in, in, his, in his mind. He has this gorgeous wife. And instead of, enjoying her uh, he's thinks too much he's he's too theoretical uh, and then this uh, Caliban like figure Caliban's uh, this character in, in Shakespeare uh, in the Tempest I believe it is um, uh, Aminadab represents the the opposite uh, of this pure cerebral uh, mindset he's this you know, physic. He represents physicality. Really, uh, Hawthorne spells it out in the middle of the story. He says, um, "With his vast strength, his shaggy hair, his smoky aspect, and the indescribable earthiness." Sorry, my dog's howling. Um, that entrusted him, uh, encrusted him. He seemed to represent man's physical nature. While Alamer's slender figure and pale intellectual face were no less apt a type of the spiritual element. So perhaps part of what Hawthorne is suggesting in this story is that when you have either of those two things in an extreme, either you're purely physical with no kind of spiritual, no spirituality, or, or you're purely uh, in your mind, purely mental with with you're out of touch with physicality that that's a recipe for disaster. That's, you know, what one, I think one way to interpret the story. Um, so, um, you know, I had mentioned, 
how, how this story reminds me a lot of, of Frankenstein. It's really the, the same uh, the same moral lesson uh, when you think about it. In Frankenstein, um, you know, the tragedy uh, befalls when the because of the main character's uh, arrogance, really. It's like, you know, the old biblical uh, principle that pride comes before a fall. But more specifically, uh, it's, it's this particular kind of arrogance is really the arrogance of trying to play God. Um, in, in Victor Frankenstein's case, he, he's wanting to play God by creating life in an unnatural way, uh, not by reproduction, but by um, getting these cadavers uh, you know, robbing graves and, and trying to, uh, using electricity to try to create a, a life uh, himself. You know, he's, he's trying to play God. In the case of uh, Alamer, uh, he, he's trying to play God by perfecting uh, his wife, who is already beautiful, but she has this one little mark on her face that he obsesses about and thinks he can can perfect uh, nature that God created her with that birthmark, and He thinks that's a defect, and that He can, um, you know. So it's this intellectual arrogance that that brings about the tragedy in both stories. Um, just to kind of elaborate on that um, uh, for a second. Um, this is still the first paragraph. Um, the higher intellect, the imagination, the spirit, and even the heart might all find their congenial element in pursuits, in pursuits which, as some of their ardent votaries believed, would ascend from one step of powerful intelligence to another until the philosopher should lay his hand on the secret of creative force and perhaps make new worlds for himself. Remember we saw Emerson say something similar um, that we can make our own worlds. Again, this, this God complex. We know not whether Almer possessed this degree of faith in man's ultimate control over nature. And of course, what the story ends up showing and what Frankenstein shows is we don't have control over nature. And, and we still deal with this in, in different ways. Cloning, um, as one example that comes to mind, some would argue that's a case of us trying to play God. Um, the idea that we can control things like the climate, you know, so a lot of the, you know, uh, discussion of climate change and so forth, that at least one element of that, uh, someone argue is this, the same kind of tendency to believe that we are so powerful that we can, you know, have a, such an impact on nature, on the climate, uh, et cetera. So again, that these, uh, the insights in, in this story are, are relevant. Sorry, my son is I'm not sure what he's doing, but anyway, um, so let's see. Uh, we've mentioned the um, we've mentioned the utilitarian principle um, it, it, when we were discussing Emerson. Here we see it again in this story. Um, let's see um, the the paragraph that begins in one sense. It is replied Almer, or rather the elixir of immortality. So again, you see, not as only he, you know, trying to perfect life, but trying to cheat death. Um, which, again, we see that, and we still have that, especially those who are don't believe in like the an afterlife and and so forth. There's this this real desire, understandably so, to try to, you know, to cheat death to somehow through our own um, intellect to bring about immortality. Um, so, no king on his guarded throne could keep his life if I, in my private station, this is Elmer talking, should deem that the welfare of millions justified me in depriving him of it. So first of all, he's, again, this shows his arrogance. He's saying that he is so smart and powerful he could, he could take out any king on his throne. And the part of this that's, you know, utilitarian says, should I deem that the welfare of millions justified me in depriving him of it? Remember, the utilitarian principle is we should do whatever brings about the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people, even if it means sacrificing the few. 
in this case, sacrificing one, you know, king. Uh, again, I, in, in one of the lectures on Emerson, uh, I pointed out what, what I believe anyway is, is the, the fallacy of the utilitarian principle, namely that it takes something that is, quali that is qualitative life and reduces it to something that's quantitative, you know, a, a mere uh, number. All right. Um, let's see. Um, here we see matter and spirit, earth and heaven have both done their part. So, so again, that's, there's a clear uh, a passage that illustrates that one juxtaposition we mentioned earlier, the juxtaposition of matter and spirit. Um, let's see, we covered that. Um, so th the other big theme in this story, in addition to, um, uh, you know, the the uh, the danger of playing God um, is the danger of pursuing perfection. Um, you know, so here, here's a passage that speaks to that. Uh, the scenery and the figures of actual life were perfectly represented, uh, but with that bewitching yet indescribable difference, which always makes a picture, an image, or a shadow so much more attractive than the original. Makes me think of uh, some of the things we do today, like airbrushing um, or, you know, doctoring photos, using Photoshop and so forth to try to make reality, quote unquote, perfect. Uh, but it's kind of, it's a fool's errand. You know, first of all, it's, it's, it's not real, but it, it can actually lead to a kind of self-destructive obsession Eating disorders, for instance, is one uh, example of that. Uh, some of the Romantic poets uh, realize this this danger. Uh, I, I'm thinking when I read this passage, I, I think in particular of "Ode on a Grecian Urn" by John Keats. If you read that poem, you see at first the the poet admires this urn, this vase, because it has a depiction on it, a painting of what seems to be perfection. These two lovers who are forever frozen in time, so they will never grow old. They will forever have their bliss, as Keats writes in the poem. But the downside is that's the opposite of life. The, the minute you try to freeze life into some perfect moment, you you literally bring about death. I mean, first, the, the, the figures on this urn are... First of all, they're not real, of course, but the, the poet at first kind of falls for the illusion that they that they represent life. But but what Keats is trying to say, I think, is that when you go down that path, you try to create perfection. The, the only way to do so is is to take away life. That life itself is about movement and change and being dynamic. But we have this impulse. Again, I understand, like as a parent. You know, there, there's a tendency, man, I wish I could freeze my children at this age when they're, you know, young and cute and all this. But obviously to do so would be the antithesis of life. And, and, and this story shows that very directly, that in his attempt to make uh, Georgiana perfect, um, Almer ends up killing her, ends up bringing about death. Um, let's see, I think there was one other point I wanted to make, if I can remember. Yeah, I guess just the, the, you know, this kind of blurry line between science and superstition that we tend to often make, think that the, that, uh, the difference between science and superstition or, I don't know, sup or you know, spirituality, if you will, we, we, we tend to think that's black and white, but, but Hawthorne is suggesting that's, that's not so true that in, in our day, I think it's the same thing that we have many quote scientific beliefs that, that we believe more on faith than, than actual data. Uh, and so, uh, Hawthorne says, he now, this is a paragraph that begins when Georgiana recovered consciousness. Toward the end of that paragraph, we see 
Sorry, the dogs are going nuts again. This is real life, all right? It's not perfect, but it, it's, it's real. Uh, he now knelt by his wife's side, watching her earnestly, but without alarm, for he was confident in his science and felt that he could draw a magic circle round her within which no evil might intrude. Magic. You know, we think of magic as being the opposite of science, but I think here Hawthorne is subtly, or maybe not so subtly, making the point I, I, I did a second ago that, that it's not so black and white where science is purely objective and religion, spirituality uh, is, is, you know, is somehow the opposite. Then in reality, um, th there's a blurry line, if there is a line uh, at all. And, and that's another danger the story, I think, warns us about is, is having too much confidence in, in science um, or, you know, d dismissing uh, realities beyond uh, the physical.